Welcome, good people, to another episode of the Finnovator Podcast with me, Stuart Bell, business coach and founder of Idaria Coaching Consulting. And uh, in this episode, uh, this is going to be an absolute treat. Uh, Stephen Prendable is the uh, founder and brains behind Forte Asset Solutions. Uh, and when I said in the, the pre-notes that he's one of the most interesting people to see speak, I really, really mean it. Stephen's one of those presenters that at the end of any event that he speaks at, he's always the one that's on last because I guess the event uh, promoters must know that he's the kind of pe- person that people will stick around to listen to. And I, 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 I was reminded of this late last year when I went along to the IFA Future Forum and his presentation unpacked not just valuations, not just sale price of business, but importantly, what excited me was outlined specifically what is perceived by the market as being the most valuable and attributes of a financial advice business. And for me, this is, this is key because when I'm coaching, uh, there's a really interesting correlation between what people will pay a lot of money for in terms of the, the attributes of a business and what I'm ultimately trying to help businesses to implement. Uh, but most importantly, in this session, it wasn't just about you know how much uh, business is being paid for. What are the trends? We also explored a lot of Stephen's story himself, and there's a lot of it that I didn't know the detail around. And to say that he has enjoyed success in various different areas, I just kind of own a half the story because on top of that, he's come through some some challenges that I, I know would uh, probably put lesser people off. But anyway, I hope you get an absolute buzz out of this one. Stephen is a fascinating person to speak to, and actually, uh, in the week that preceded this, I got to go down and spend lunch with him, and again, just a fantastic conversation. I hope you, hope you enjoy hearing from Stephen. So I'm going to hand over, uh, and let's talk to Stephen about the view from above. All righty, girls and guys, welcome uh, to today's uh, masterclass, The View From Above with Stephen Prendeville. Um, I've been really looking forward to this one. And I sort of said in some of my show notes that whenever I see Stephen's name on a uh, forum or, or, a, or, a, or a conference, it's always at the end. And I think the reason for it is because he's someone that you always want to stay at the end to hear. And I remember seeing him at the IFA Future Forum uh, at the end of last year and just seeing him run through these data-driven insight into uh, what, uh, what is valued at the moment, where the industry's headed, what's been happening, uh, what, what, what positive, and also some of the other trends that we've been experiencing, and just being able to understand with absolute clarity what was going on. It just reinforced for me a lot of the stuff that, 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 um, that the practices that I've been working on have been doing, and also gave me confidence about where the industry was headed. So he's been doing what he does for a while. He's, everybody you speak to about Stephen has the same experience that uh, uh, he's, he just knows what he's talking about and he's just a lovely person to deal with. And the story that we're going to have an opportunity to unpack today, uh, I, di- I didn't even know half of it, but it's it's the story with uh, a lot of sort of a lot of le- lessons along the way, but also we're going to talk uh, at the end of it all about where the industry's headed. And hopefully from your perspective, you know, if you're coming here to get some insights into what you should focus on and uh, what to do more of, if you want to do less of, I know you're going to walk away from here with that kind of insights. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to dive into the whole story and I'm, we're going to go from the beginning to the end, but, and then we're going to dive into where the industry is at. So let's, without any further delay, Stephen, are you there? Yes. This is the bit where I, should, I wonder if I should start, have, start tap dancing, you know? Uh, you know, they're old when the movie theater used to break down and they'd have the two guys at the piano and they go, play me oh, out, Sam. Yes. <laughs> okay. You know what they say? They say never work with, uh, was it kids, dogs, and technology. And I've got all three in the office today. How are you this morning? I'm very well, and thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. I don't think it's generous at all. I think it's well earned. As I said, um, I it wasn't until we started talking I realised sort of how action packed your your journey has been. It's been over a fair few decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you fit, still fit along into it, right? Yeah, look, it's it's I've been really fortunate with you know a, a career, uh, and also now. I've just celebrated my 20 years of selling and valuing financial services businesses, um, and I love what I do. It's, that was in, that was in March, right? 20 years. Yeah, yeah. That was. Uh, did, you, did you do anything to celebrate, or is that still still got to be done? Um, look, I try and celebrate every small occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I love yes. it. 
I'm interested, uh, like I think most people on the call know you, but how do you normally, des- if someone says, you know, what do you do? How do you normally describe it? Um, I suppose if it's in a bar on a Friday night, I might say that I am a founder of a small M&A uh, business specialising in financial services. If it's an elevated conversation without ego, it's I'm a business broker and a business valuer. Fair enough. That's a, that's a very concise way of doing it. And specifically practices, have you ever sold any other types of businesses outside of that? Oh, yeah, look, dealer groups, um, service providers, uh, tech, um, tech, platform providers. So, yeah, there's been a diversity. A of stuff. Yeah, so the, but the core is financial planning and financial planning and more and more seeing financial planning in diversified businesses, accounting, <laughs> risk, uh, mortgage as more and more um, services are put under one roof. One roof. So can we, let's go back to the beginning because I remember when I, I, I started to look at your LinkedIn profile, it was like you've been through kind of a few iterations and you started out in 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 kind of a very different industry or well, it was the same industry, but it's a different kind of to take on it, wasn't it? Yeah, look, it's um, banking in New Zealand, stockbroking in the UK. Um, I was Australia's youngest Australian certified investment planner in 1987 Yep. Um, August of 1987. <laughs> uh, so no one's accused me of having the Midas touch or time. <laughs> um, and look, I came from stockbroking into financial planning. And also it was an industry at its grassroots and it was very much a sales environment mm. uh, at that time. Um, and then after... The um, October crash it, and then going into a recessionary environment, I realised how little I knew and right. so went into funds management um, and, well, thought I was, but I was, um, I was with a group, Brick Securities, which was a mortgage provider for those that have got the same sort of length of time. Uh, it got acquired by National Mutual because of... My background on the advice, I then headed up the new National Mutual Financial Planning in Victoria. Uh, my role was to primarily teach uh, risk writers how to be financial planners. The period was sort of, I was there for around three years in the high of the recession. And I, I look back on that and just saying it's probably the worst culture I've ever worked in. Okay. Uh, yeah, look, it was a... It was an environment whereby the culture, for me anyway, was that it seemed to be that knowledge was power and therefore no one shared knowledge. Right. Um, I had, it was matrix uh, management. That meant that I was reporting to four other people, uh, which also meant that I really reported to no one. Right. Um, it, it was a period of significant stress within the, I suppose, the industry, and particularly in funds management, when capital guarantee funds weren't all of a sudden that capital yeah. guaranteed, um, when we had, you know, the bond, uh, that's the first sort of bond market that I'd seen blow out and money could be lost and what everyone thought was safe. Uh, but, yeah, that period was, I look back and it was really what not to do as far as culture is concerned. Um, but then fortunately, I got parachuted into first state fund managers in 93, okay. um, um, state manager, inward flow of funds was 30 million when I arrived. And when I left, it was in excess of um, 1.2 billion. Wow. Um, it was the most amazing culture um, and it was primarily because this business first aid was increasing by 300% a year. And I saw the best management exhibited by Chris Cuff, uh, the CEO. And I was really fortunate. I was in a fantastic uh, team uh, with with now Frank Casarotti uh, from now known for Magellan. Um, And... Uh, Also, um, Rob Adams, uh, now CEO of Perpetual, Uh, and we were we're on a mission. You know, we were the the David's Goliath. Um, We were taking on BT and Perpetual, Um, and we had a little imputation fund. 
that was managed by Greg Perry. It had three million in it when I started. Um, it won an award, and then we just wrote it. Uh, and it was just a, it was, it was passionate. It was fantastic to be involved in that sort of environment. So coming from a great negative into a great positive. Um, was really affirming. I think I was the 33rd employee. Frank and I argue whether who was first. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, And but by the ninth year, sorry, eighth year there, there was in excess of 500 and 50 uh, employees. Originally, we got involved in even the production of uh, prospectuses. Wow. Um, and, and, And more people got more refined. The ability to make a difference probably diminished for me, um, and that's when I accepted a partnership into Deloitte's, and I was um, a global partner. I was also then uh, the director of um, DFS, went into right. a business, re-engineered that business, um, had some early success. Not all easy. Well, we we're at the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, for yep. Stoke, again, who were around that time it was uh, Mercy uh, trying to put BT and X Plan together. Um, so this is back in '99. Uh, uh, so bleeding edge technology as it was at the time, um, and but had built a team. Um, very very proud of what we achieved, and then it literally got sold from underneath me. Uh, and then I watched, unfortunately, the destruction of a business I loved. And it was bought by Stockfords, who um, was the aggregator at that time. We were the 50th transaction. Um, literally a day after the um, first settlement, they announced the first profit downgrade, and I just saw an erosion of the business that I loved. And that... that- that must have been extreme, like, because I remember when we spoke, you said the one thing that really drove you in that business was that there was a purpose that was bigger than you. It was it was bigger than the team, and you were really driven. Yeah, there was an underdog in there. And then to go on that ride, it must have been like, you know, having a great bunch of friends, and then everybody moves away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first state was, was that um, Deloitte's partnership. I absolutely loved the culture yeah. uh, within it. Now, true, I did come in as a partner and didn't work my way up the, the pyramid, um, but it was such a supportive environment. And particularly when you, all you've got to do is walk to the, you know, uh, around the corner, step into someone's office, and they just happen to be one of the best tech, tech or tax uh, experts in Australia. You know, it was very collegiate, though. Going in there as a head of financial planning, it's butted up against at the time, and it still exists today, the perspective that as financial advisors, we're really just salesmen. Um, Mm -hmm. The first thing that I did once I had my team in place and systems somewhat working was provide all partners for a free um, wealth check. And as soon as they saw what we actually did, mm. then the business previous to my appointment, it was um, 95% was from external referrals and only 5% from internal. That immediately flipped uh, within the 12 months to 95% internal referrals. And we were embraced. We're no longer seeing as salespersons, but salespeople, but actually as professionals looking for a single goal, the outcome, you know, greater outcome for the client. Um, what did the what did the health chat look like? Oh, look, it was really just you know sort of a PL balance sheet um, okay. against goals. You know, looking at insurance, their requirements. You know, most of the partnership was sort of like myself. You know. Um, Little kids, big mortgage. Uh, yeah. Then you had, you know, you had the whole sort of age there, and it was just really everyone just sort of you know, saying, "Okay, it, it's pretty good. You just need to do this and this. You know, be mindful of that." There's a. I, I'm going. I'm always. I always like to bring up film references, but there's a great movie called Ford versus Ferrari. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, know, you know the scene where Matt Damon puts him in the GT, the the head of Ford, Henry Ford, the second <laughs> or third and takes him around the track. He's about to cancel the whole program, and he oh. takes him around the track, and he's just like, 
I had no idea. And it's kind of, it's like when you can put somebody in the position that you're going to put their clients in, like a partner or, and they experience it, it makes all the difference. Because it's very, I think it's very hard to endorse something if you haven't experienced it. Well, I think it's the perceptions versus reality. It's, and you need that to build trust and confidence. Yeah. Uh, the, the accountants were extremely protective about their clients and rightly so. Yeah. But once they thought that, okay, well, actually they're in safe hands. And then what happened from there is that clients were going back and thanking them for the referrals. The other part of, uh, for, for, you know, for the introduction, what also happened though is we also ensured that the accountants had, there was open architecture so they could see all the latest communication. They could see all the latest performance. It was, it was good as we could do on real time. Yep. Um, and that also gave them confidence that if they ever took a call, and it was something around wealth management or assets or whatever it was, they had immediately knew so that that already became we were operating as a team uh, yeah. for a single outcome. And, again, that just shifted the trust and confidence uh, and, and we enjoyed, you know, really early success. Uh, Love it. So this, I guess, this, the, 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 the situation with Deloitte, that was the point at which you, you left the corporate world, right? Um, Deloitte was, yeah, and then that was, so they made a decision to sell. Um, it was a, it was really that a CEO had come in for five-year tenure, had made a promise that the average partner earnings would be X amount. He was short. At the same time, I wanted to create at the Perth office. I put up not only the PL but balance sheet. The balance sheet was the gap. So all of a sudden there was an independence problem and Deloitte M&A uh, took us to market and it was really checkbook um, was what the focus was on. I, as I said, watched the destruction of the business I really loved mm. and was had a period of time where I could literally sort of step back I was on Gardenly for a year. It's a real privilege. And I was just turning 40. I look back on what I had done and then, but still came to this, I suppose it was, I was grieving. And then mm. I went to an FBA conference uh, 2003, I think it was Adelaide. And because I had been seen to have just lost 8.8 million. Um, many people then shared their experiences, both buyers and sellers, about their disappointment that they had, on the outcomes they had achieved. I still, the stool, you know, penny hadn't dropped for me. It took me months later, and then I thought, okay, <laughs> I think I can do better than what I witnessed, and this, and then really focused on. And I knew the secret, and I was making sure you had the right people at the table. It was about culture. Get right. culture right. And then, yes, get the commercial element right. But ensure you've got the right people at the table. My, I suppose the promise I've made at the start, and which I know I've honoured 20 years later, is ensure that you're getting the best advisor. So if I'm representing a client, get it. Get the best advisor for your client, get the best employer for your staff, and then you'll do, do those two things and you'll get the best outcome for your family. Okay. But it's, it's making sure you've got this alignment of culture first. Got it. I think um, Richard Branson says something similar. He said uh, a lot of there's this whole idea of share, shareholder value is the most important thing. Get shareholder value right. The, 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 you know, the client, anyway, he said, it's the other way around. You look after your employees, the employees look after the clients, the clients look after the shareholder value. And that's it. You know, payments are either, you know, 12 or 24 months. Um, the least amount of change that that business goes through, then you're going to get the maximum client retention. And so we're looking for at the buyer, seller systems, processes, mm. pricing, investment philosophy, uh, tech stack. We're looking for the smallest amount of change. We're dropping a small pebble into a large pond from a client's perspective. They see very little change. So there's yeah. very little reason to leave. That makes a lot of sense. So you started, the, you went out and started your own business, essentially. Yeah. How was that? Um, you could have come yeah. from corporate, right? And now suddenly yeah. it's, it's, did you find it a big transition or a big change or? 
Yeah, look, at, um, I also had a partner um, and that partner had been basically self-employed all his working life. Okay. And so I thought I had a, a mentor or a coach and certainly someone experienced to take me on this path that I'd chosen. The mm. path was not only was um, becoming self-employed, but two, we were doing something that no one had ever done before in Australia. Yep. Um, and, you know, yes, you've got conviction of what you're doing and why you're doing it, but it's when you take a path that no one else has taken, there's an element of risk. And so um, I did it with a partner. Unfortunately, I um, probably chose, I did choose the wrong partner. No. Um, I would just say to anyone within partnerships, ensure that you've got independent chairman and independent accountants and also be really close to your accounts yourself. I was primarily focused on marketing and business development as well right. as obviously um, transacting. Um, and so that was my role and my other partner's role was more on the financial management as well as also transacting. Okay. Uh, but yes, um, so broke that partnership um, eight years ago and created Forte 12 years ago. Now, c- can we can we dive into this a bit, Stephen? By all means. Because I, I, I didn't know how the story, but I mean, it wasn't like the business just kind of had a slight mishap. And from what I understand it, you, you, you'd, you'd had this experience and success all your whole career. And then obviously you have the situation with Deloitte, which would have been disheartening for anybody. But then you you have the situation where you're building the business and, and things are going really, really well. And you, it's almost like playing snake and ladders and you, you get the long snake and you're down at the beginning. How, how did that feel? I mean, obviously, it, but how do you climb out of that? Yeah, look, it, um, I, I, there's a certain amount of grieving and self-reflection when you've made a big mistake. And my mistake was trusting someone that wasn't worthy. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it was sort of, you know, this impact on your family, uh, your, you know, it's potentially impact on the name you've worked, you know, 30 years to, uh, to build. Um, But also it was one of, I think Churchill said, when you're going through shit, keep going. (laughs) Uh, and so one way you've gotten that yeah look I could have jumped I could have come back into corporate I could have done things but uh, I was really I'm passionate about what I do I love what I do Um, I'm also somewhat in control by being self-employed of my own future yeah Um, and yeah it took you know it it did as a a long snake back to the start um, but it, you know, and yes, I wish it hadn't happened. Um, but I think that in everyone's career and certainly in life, we're, we're going to hit walls. Yeah. Um, and yes, it's testing. Um, and, but if you've got good people around you, uh, and again, if you've got clear vision, um, you know, it too will pass. And, and so, you know, you, you build. Another one, I don't know, it's attributed to virtual. I, I don't know if it is a Churchill, but it's attributed to me. It's um, success is going from failure to failure with no loss enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. Look, it, 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 look it, to be honest, when you've got lawyers all around you, you've, um, and one other thing I'd say is make sure that, you know, if I had my time again, I'd be in a unit trust. I'd also say liabilities would be proportional to shareholding rather than um, several. You know, if you're the last one standing, you're responsible for all debt. Um, you know, so the harshest lessons are probably some of the best lessons, and they're certainly ones yeah. you, you never forget. Uh, but yeah, look, I agree. There has to be. There's always going to be disappointments. There's you are going to hit walls that um, in our personal lives and our business lives. Uh, yes, I had a had stellar uh, career right until you know I was you know am I coming into fifty? No. <laughs> Uh, no, we were just literally having a conversation. We we're having a conversation before I came in about, um, I think it was about two years ago, 
CNN, this guy was doing an interview and his children, his toddler walks in and the nanny runs in after. And I was like, I hope that doesn't happen today. And it did happen. So it's good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> but I also <laughs> said to you at the time that it actually gives an insight into who you are. And that's pretty yeah. special. And I think since COVID, it, it's weird. I think it's actually adds an element uh, to it, not distress. I, I, look, I actually love it. I've got the dog over there. I, I love to have the opportunity to do that. And I can honestly say one of the, I mean, there was, COVID was, I wouldn't go through it again for all the money in the world, but the one thing it did enable us to do, which is kind of like your experience with the gardening leave, it, it allowed you to spend more time. Um, and at the end of the day, that's the thing that's going to be there in, in 20, 30 years, your family, if you play it right. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, that's... Um, I want to like there you are. You stay obviously. There's there's a whole there's a whole emotional thing there as well. And picking yourself up again. But I'm interested in the way you built the business up to where it is now. Like, what did you do differently the second time? Other than you know, keep 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 make very mindful of the people you were partnering with and keep an eye on the accounts. Was there any lessons you learned about how to do it better? Oh look, I think um, there wasn't a lot of fine tuning. We are constantly looking at our our business and what tech we should be using. But the core elements never should really change. Right. Uh, and I'm not oversimplifying it. If you get the right people at the table, you know, half the job is done and then you just put the commercial part together. You know, yes, you know, I, and also leave lawyers to the end, use a third <laughs> party. So, you know, because every business owner's baby is beautiful in their eyes, but not maybe so much for the wider marketplace. Um, so I have an independent, um, you know, when I was selling, uh, well, being part of the sale of Deloitte's, I had eight people on one side of the table and just me on the other. And they seemed to know the business better than I did. Um, it's somewhat intimidating uh, at the time. Um, and so, and the other part of what, what, we didn't have back 20 years ago is actually we had no real idea of value. The the only thing we had is we had AMP's bowler, MLC's bowler, which was slightly less, and yeah. the other bit of information that you know you could look to was any listed transactions, which doesn't compute into unlisted transactions. Right. One of the things that I did sort of almost from the start was I started reporting on valuations. Okay. And, and the single thing to do with that was that, and again, you, you said in the start, I love data. Um, yeah. data you know, you're getting more and more information to be able to make an informed decision. And so for the last 18 years, I've been reporting on all my transactions. Um, and then also talking about what's the point of difference, you know, uh, what's a three times business or a six times either? How do you know what? Why does some get more, some get less? Um, and valuations, you know, it's we look at every facet of the business, and then what we do is we articulate what strengths and weaknesses are. Now, what everyone principal wants is actually the articulation of weaknesses because if they address that, they can yeah. improve their business value. And so when I was going through my transaction and also I'm starting to, you know, yes, I've got an M and A team um, working there, but they're, not, they're just so focused on price. Right. And, and so I was sort of being dragged along in the process. And so the key learnings, you know, from uh, the original business to Forte, we, they had the, we had the systems, we had the process, we spend time up front and then a transaction we follow, you know, we, it takes on average two to three weeks to create an information memorandum. We list right. it for sale. At the moment, we're achieving about uh, around 2,000 um, individual uh, people visit our website a month. Uh, means that we probably have averaging 30 to 50 inquiries for every asset we represent. We spend considerable time to finding the best five. Only five get to meet our client. Wow. Then our client, we're singularly reliant upon their feedback of, and this is sounds soft, but it's the this is the thing we're looking for. After every meeting, we'll say, "Do you like them? Do you trust them?" Mm -hmm. uh, 
And if we get that, then we can advance to the next stage. We call for an indicative offer. We'll take two, maybe three parties into due diligence. We then will have three weeks in there, come out of that. We call for final offers. And then we go to my client instructs who they prefer to deal with. Yep. And I've probably got a week to two weeks negotiating heads of agreement. And we're trying to cover everything we possibly can so that when we go to the construct of the contract, we've already got most of the issues hopefully on the table. But you move from a five-page heads of agreement to a 55-page contract, and you've also got lawyers. Um, we've somewhat reduced the risk is that I work with a lawyer I have been for more than 15 years. Uh, so he's probably now done more transactions in the financial service m and space than, than most. Um, and where our systems, processes, and templates are overlaid. Uh, right. So, yeah, we, we know where pressure points are. We know where, you know, deals can be at risk. Um, and so but you prepare for them as best as you can. And the only way to really do that is just open communication with buyer and seller. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's what a third party is doing is – Basically, I'm conveying bad news, maybe back to my client. Uh, your baby's not as pretty as you thought. Um, or I've already told them that um, before on the creation of the IM. So there's a reality check. Um, there's a reality check around price. As soon as you take the price out of it, then we start focusing what actually happens. At the end of it, price has fallen to about number five in consideration. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, well, that makes sense, yeah. Because... <laughs> Yeah, if you've got the right people at the table, it's not so much about the, the sticker price on what you're selling for, it's actually how much you receive on the back end. Mm. You know, so you look, it's, it's risk mitigation, risk assessment and mitigation. That's, I mean, this thing if you're buying a business, that's ultimately you're making a decision as to whether this thing is going to, you're kind of like you're going to get it and then a day after Christmas it's going to fall apart or it's got some magic source in there that you didn't oh. know about. And I mean, yeah, you, it's, it's hard to know that stuff, but I guess, you know, if, you, if you're asking the right questions, you're more likely to find it. Can I ask, I, want, I do want to get in and talk a little bit about how practices evolved and what you're seeing, but I, I'd love to know in terms of what you do for practices, has it, has it changed the work you're doing a lot in the last five to 10 years, or is it still fundamentally you're doing the same type of work or the same blend of work? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the first part is we're a lot less transactions. Um, This market, uh, since basically Royal Commission, Hain Report, uh, new legislation, COVID, grandfathered revenue, client re-engagement, we've had an artificial suppression of normal retirement. Uh, Business owners haven't felt that they've been able to walk away from the business because there's just been nothing but headwinds. There's right. nothing but challenges that to meet. Uh, and there's still challenges. You know, we've obviously got, you know, uh, talent or labour pool uh, is, is a critical one. Everyone's at full utilisation. And, but what's happened, so I've, we've been doing substantially less number of transactions. Uh, and that's but I, I think the market will come back into we're already getting a sense of coming back into a more normality. Yeah. For us, pre-Royal uh, Commission, we were probably had 10 businesses for sale at any one time. Uh, currently, we have three. Um, but what I do note is that the, the businesses that are coming to the market are much better businesses than they were five years ago. When you say better, can you? How do you mean? What? What? How are they better? Yeah. Okay. So one, every client's engaged. There's no grandfathered. Um, there's the pricing. Over eighty percent of our industry is now fixed pricing. From a valuer's perspective, that changes uh, valuation straight away because then the revenue and profit is not exposed to exogenous factors of markets or geopolitical movements. You actually have control. You know, on January 1, what your revenue is going to be on the 31st of December. Um, so fixed fees. Then you're looking at better tech, better service outcomes. Uh, so And better outcomes for the client. But also every client is now profitable. The larger client is not subsidizing the smaller client. Uh, yeah. And 
the focus is on service delivery um, and sustainable service. And so businesses over the last five years have evolved substantially from where we were. Yeah. So to answer your question, we're doing less but with better businesses. Our processes are all the same. Um, we're probably looking now at valuations have changed. Um, so it's, it used to always be recurring revenue. Now it's a combination recurring revenue and EBIT. Okay, uh, a combination. Yeah. And what I preach every time I can get I'm on a stage is that you need business owners need to be operating their profit at 35% or more. And that, that's a minimum. Yeah, minimum. At around 40%, you'll start and assuming that the 80% of the gross revenue is recurring, you start to get price convergence at three times recurring revenue or six times EBIT. And so, right. so that's the target to maintain because everything used to sell on three times. Yeah. Um, but again, remembering that when I first started doing this, there was volume overrides. You know, a 50 million business buys another 50 million business. As soon as you get to 100 million, the a platform will give you another 20 basis points, 200 grand will just fall to the bottom line before any other synergies. Yeah. Uh, so there's not as much synergies, but at the same period of time, there's never been greater level of demand. And the reason for the demand is just the rising cost of doing business. Yeah. You need size and scale. 45% of our industry is operating less than $500,000 in gross revenue. Sorry, so let me get that. 45% of the businesses out there yeah. are under 500K. Yeah. And they're the ones that are feeling that everyone's feeling the pinch. But so, they're the sector that I'm most concerned about. And so we're going to see a lot of merger and uh, activity in that end of the market, simply survival, not the, you know, survival, thrive. This is survival. Um, single operators operating at that level. Um, there's a real limited p and but even limited balance sheet. And so you need, you know, the top 10% of our industry is operating at around the one point, sorry, I'm dirty, uh, about 1.2, 1.3. In other words, the, the sweet spot? or the, No, not sweet spot. The, yeah. Most of them are about 1.2, 1.3. Yeah, so the industry average is 1.2. Uh, the industry average on profitability, though, is 24% as well. And I'm, I'm yeah. advocating that that needs to be increased by at least 10%. Do you know what? I've done so, so many – pricing always comes back. And I, it's like you just – when you think it's not going to be a thing, it is a thing, and now it's coming back again. And I think you said that. Like when I first started in pricing, you do the profit model at 30%. But the reality is now I tend to do it at 40 to 50 because it's always – you generally get practices will underestimate what it takes or they'll make problems that will chew away at the, at the profit margin. And that's why you end up – you can do a pricing model at 40%. But if you don't have this value overlay and you don't really smart about it, you can end up with, um, yeah, you're 24%. It doesn't surprise me. You there? So, um, yeah, there's still challenges ahead. Uh, but I think that what is the first time that we don't have legislative hurdles in front of us. We've now got a now known environment. In actual fact, the hope is with the quality of advice review that we're actually, instead of headwinds that we're faced, we're about to get a, a clear and full sale going forward. It is amazing how quickly the media perception of advice changed. Yeah, um, but I think that, you know, I think with the removal of banks, it's a restoration of trust. I agree, yeah, 100%. Um, You know, and also, everyone. I know the headlines shout that we've lost 10,000, but... Having a look at again, sorry, but data. No, this you, this you presented this at the Future Forum, and yeah, it gave so, me so much confidence. Please go for it. So, accountants who, who were providing limited advice, mainly within the self-managed super the front sector, they represent fifty-one percent of those exiting. The next cohort is super base uh, super based advisors, seventeen percent. And then 18, another 18% came from limited advice providers. Mm -hmm. Where we start to really, and so the next section that came through was those that had normally sub 400,000 in revenue and highly exposed to grandfathered revenue. 
And when yep. grandfathered revenues ceased, all of a sudden, so did they. Dealer groups made a decision that there wasn't a risk reward uh, issue there, and we started losing. Then we started to come into the core advisors. Yep. Um, and they had a significant amount of maturity. They've been in the industry for a long time. Um, and the last 12 months coming up with the code of ethic is also when we started to lose uh, what I consider real advisors. Yeah. And they're also in the area of stockbrokers and they're also the areas of risk riders who unfairly were treated uh, with what exam they had to do, what hoops they had to jump. Um, but when, so when we talk about the, the great exodus, I actually think as a core, yes, we've had good professional advisors leave. Yes. Last part of that has been burnout, though. You know, the mental health Great. issues that have been, for a number of reasons, but really just the speed of change. Uh, and the other thing from that presentation, that's exactly right. You were like, a lot of the people are leaving are the ones, I mean, the people are still sticking around. They're sticking around. They've been through all of the last few years, and they're still here because they love it. Yeah. Um, and what also the data you showed is the people who are leaving proportionally are not practice owners. Exactly. The, you know, a large part of that was also salaried bank advisors. Yeah. You know, so accountants, salaried bank advisors, super fund, uh, you know, salaries. They didn't have businesses. This is mm. also part of the reason where a lot of people say, oh, you must have been really busy uh, when all that was going on. No, there wasn't businesses to sell. Yeah. And also I think business owners, not only did they have to re-engineer their businesses and couldn't even and so deferred retirement, but they just had no head space to think about selling. Yeah. And they also thought that if there's been all these 10,000 exits, there must have been an avalanche of business coming to market, therefore prices must have fallen. No. But that's an easy sort of, you know, assumption to make. There seem to, uh, certainly in the last few years, there seemed to be a real gulf open. And you tell me if I'm wrong on this, that businesses that were really, really good, and we'll talk about what makes a good business in just a second, they started to get a premium. Anything which wasn't good, it almost got to the point where you couldn't give it away. Has that been your experience? or? Yeah, so well, the, remembering when you had C and D class clients? Yeah. No longer. Um, <laughs> it's And also, so... What's getting harder is if your average fee is less than three and a half thousand, the yep. demand substantially falls away, rightly or wrongly. It can still be profitable. It depends on you know what the business model is. Um, but and so yeah, three and a half very hard to to sell yeah. and less demand. Um, you really need to be at five and a half um, to be at sort of the sweet spot of of demand. Plus. I used to look, when I did pricing models, I used to look at anything under three grand, we'd have a really good look at it. Now it's like anything under four and a half grand, we're going to have a look at it because it's it's just, re it's really hard. I mean, it, uh, it's funny, you saw all the the, the, the commentary going, going on in the last few years about the cost of advice coming up. And I'm just looking at it going, anybody who's in the government body who doesn't understand why the cost of advice has got up has obviously got a very short memory or doesn't understand the link between what they've put in place and the actual impact at the end of it. It's, it's been frustrating. Yeah, no, and unfortunately, you know, those that Australians that really need advice, um, and this is where the removal of grandfather, a lot of those were actually grandmothers who were on pensions, and yeah. that that um, original annuity was actually paying for the service. As soon as that got removed, no service delivered. So, you know, I think there should be one. It was the reason for the removal was basically the assumption that there was no work being done for that revenue. Yeah. And that assumption was flawed. Um, but at the same time, I think in a user pay, um, every client being profitable. Um, now, some you're always going to have some pro bono work. You're going to have, you know, sort of food for the soul, you know, it, you know so there will not every client, but the most, the majority. Uh, <laughs> And then, so the, whilst so you've got service, the other part answering your question earlier, what else has changed is there's also, given that our cottage industry is now becoming from a profession into a profession, is and people like me have been around for 25 years, is we're looking at age segmentation. So there's different multiples being accorded to awarded to age. And so, for instance, if more than 30% of your clients are greater than 70 years of age, a discount is applied to the business. 
because there's a mortality risk to that revenue and profit. Yep. That discount can be discounted somewhat if you've got aged care or estate planning, which creates intergenerational advice. Yep. Um, so if you've got an intergenerational relationship, then that fund or those fees or services quite often can transfer to the um, uh, son and daughter of uh, your client. This was a topic that came up at the Future Forum and I was asked to, to speak on intergenerational and I said the problem with intergenerational is in most cases it, does, it doesn't work. And you, you made the really point, the one area that does work is aged care. That opens the conversation naturally. It's purposeful, whereas most other methods of doing it, they can come across as really clumsy. Yeah, the thing with when you're putting your mum into a home is it's extremely emotional for the family. Yeah. And that's when the advisor wins the hearts and the minds uh, of the clients. Uh, and I think at the moment there's only about 33% of businesses uh, actually um, provide aged care. But given yep. the aging of uh, Australia and, and the, the globe, I think it's absolutely becoming an essential um, service, C- certainly worthy of consideration if you don't have it in your business at the moment. Well, I wanted to ask two questions and I want to sort of um, get into another one. The first thing I wanted to ask is um, I've spoken to a few advisors recently. I'm going to doing a podcast with um, one of them from the UK in the next couple of weeks, Alan Smith, who've been able to almost like step back from having to give advice. Or they, they're either the CEO or they're just focused on just – and the business is kind of running. I wouldn't say independently of them, but they are not the central focus. You must have seen this a lot, and that, that would be a business that would be presumably very valuable to buy. Is that correct? Yeah, so the first thing – and we've seen it a lot just recently maybe with those that um, weren't able to pass code of uh, ethics is they've elevated you – know, from they've moved away from the tools and they've moved yeah. to working on the business instead of in the business. Yeah. So the first thing that that does is actually normally gets better outcomes because there's time to think. Uh, The second part of that is you've actually reduced key person risk. Yeah. The principle is all of a sudden, you know, there's now you've got other advisors and this is what we're seeing a lot of and a lot of certainly work in our valuation is, and, and this is also part of, answering the problem on the talent pool is all of a sudden those advisors become senior advisors and they're also becoming minority shareholders in the business as well to retain yeah. the talent, but also to reward um, outcomes as well. So, yes, and I think that this is the other one where everyone thinks that there's going to be, again, a great access in 2026 with the education criteria. I actually think that what people are doing now is just building businesses and they'll be able to move into a CEO or a chairperson role yep. and come off the tools, but not necessarily walk away from a business that love. So in order to be able to do that in your experience, you've got to be able to recruit and retain and train young, not young advisors, but additional advisors. That's, 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 a, that's a given, right? Well, to do that, you've also got to have a business of substantial amount of size that you actually can invest in people. Yep. Uh, and you can experiment with systems and processes. This is where I go back to, I'm really concerned about 45% of our industry. Yeah. Um, so you have to have size. Um, and and what, sort of, what size? I mean, is this where 1.2, 1.3 is an absolute must? Yeah, um, look, I think it's at that 1.5, 1.6 when you're starting to have two partner businesses or you're starting to have uh, the ability to afford a general manager um, so who can take away the work that yeah. most principals don't like but have the business running and having management tools, systems, processes, um, and more importantly, reporting so that you can you know, constantly monitor, review yeah. <laughs> data. It almost feels like, and I'm, I want to ask you about the systems and processes because people talk about systems and processes, but and it's one of those things that I find businesses don't really get doing it until they, they, they need it last week. But um, it, it feels like, there's an inv- the ability to invest in people and then you've got to constantly have that ability to ha- it's, it's the profit game, right? If you yeah. don't have the profitability there, you're never going to grow, which means the pricing is vital. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, look, there's obviously there's startups um, and there's periods of substantial investment, mm. but, it's, uh, but it also, it's like the farmer, you're reaping your sow. You know, you, yes, you take the rewards when you can, but you've constantly got to be reinvesting back in the yep. business. Um, 
Uh, and and now yeah, there's periods of your award. There's periods you celebrate. Uh, but it's like any business. Any business, you'll just you'll come for a rise, and then it'll start to level off. Well, then you need another injection. Oh, you know, yeah. it's it's perpetual sort of growth. You never want to sell a business which is flatlining. You know, and you want to have growth around it. And at the moment, there's more growth opportunities than we've ever seen. Australians have never needed advice more than they currently do right now. now. But the problem we have is that normally they, the system is just at full utilisation and yep. you can only take on one or two clients a month. Which is, uh, your, point, which is your point about the quality of advice for you because at the moment, I mean, I've got one business that takes 80 hours to take on board a client. Through yeah. no, it's through no fault of their own. That's the system they built. And that system would have worked in a low a low legislative barrier environment it doesn't in this barrier in this environment at all. Yeah, but I think it's also having confidence in the future so that you actually reinvest in additional personnel uh, and, and, and take that growth on. Yeah. You know, create some spare capacity within the business um, because the growth opportunities in front of us are, are significant. Significant. Um, so I think that I think everyone's mentally is also bedding down the hatches. Yeah, I think this is sort of the time to really look at the environment that we've got and what opportunities are there. I, I'm just go- where it's only got about. Uh, yeah, no, I, I want to ask some more questions, but I also want to say, quick fire. You, you do a yeah. I'm going to jump to the question. You do a value. You you work like a lot of the work you do is valuations for businesses, right? Yeah, and like a, whilst we've sold, I don't, I don't know how many, but more than 250. We've probably done more than four or five hundred in valuations. Yeah. And one of the things you said to me is, if you don't know what the valuation of your business is until the day you come to sell it. Firstly, you've always got that. It's the antiques roadshow thing, right? You're coming in, you don't really know what's going on. It could be a shock, but also you got, you, you've not got anything to aim at. And you don't really know what to do. Uh, and I, I think the thing you said to me is getting evaluation done, even when you're not thinking you're selling can often be the start of, of something. Uh, absolutely. Like, if you've got an inkling uh, that it's five years out, that's when you start to right. bring in people like yourself and look to grow uh, and look at what do you need? What's best practice? Uh, because it's easy to think that you're at best practice if you've not got peers or an external that walks into different offices every day. Yeah. Um, the other part of it is not just about selling. It's what I call you know, being investor ready. It's to buy or sell or to reinvest in your own business. And so you've got to be have a, a capital position. Um, you, you've got to have a vision to start uh, of where, where you want to be and how do you get there. Uh, but I think life, as we spoke of at the start of this hour, Life is a way of interrupting the greatest of plans. <laughs> so true. Uh, and yeah. so I think that with businesses, you, you can't take your foot off. You can't mentally sort of just, you, you maybe for a moment, kick back, congratulate yourself, but you always got to be leaning into it and saying, how can I do this better? I, f- I find the older I get, I don't know if it's your experience, like I used to be just head down, bum up all the time. And as I get older, I realize that it's, it's more of a marathon. You can't, you can't, you've got to keep a pace that you can go with and implement the things you can. Otherwise, yeah, because as you said, you can't, you can't drop out of it. Yeah, you can't. It's, you know, Kazan and incremental improvement. Yeah. It's working on, not in the business. It's all of those things. But it's, and because we're so busy, but often we're getting in way of ourselves. If I, if I wanted to get an evaluation done by you, what I mean, you don't, you don't have to share if you don't want to, but what would I be paying for that? Um, look, if it's a single entity, we review the last three years. Well, as I said, it is holistic. We'll look at age demographics. We'll look at systems processes. We'll look at okay. experience and education and staff. We'll make recommendations. Um, and that work is 7500 Um, But if it's multi-entities, uh, multi-P&Ls, balance sheets, then it can be more. Okay. But essentially you're getting a, this is what it's worth. This is how to increase the price of it. It's a blueprint for what you should do if you want to sell it a certain price. Yeah, it's a statement of fact. Good. fact. This is what your yeah. business is worth at the moment. These are the strengths. These are the inhibitors or weaknesses. Um, this is how the market will see you. Have you had anyone do a, do a valuation and just realize that they've got a lot better business than they thought they had and end up selling it for a lot more than they, they would have otherwise? Yeah, look, we've, <laughs> we've had people do valuation and they turn around and say, well, this is real. 
I'll sell now. Okay. And the thing with that is every valuation actually has an element of conservatism within it. You know, right. you, know you can't over. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And nor can you go too far under, but you're not going to do a stretch. You, you've, there's an element of conservatism purely because of you know, your valuing. Um, different hat when I'm selling something. Um, And so, yeah, you can be a premium. So, yes, we've had people go, oh, I can get that. And then they've even been delighted, even more delighted, when we're able to get not only a price but but dealing with the right people, knowing that their legacy is in safe hands, their staff are in safe hands, um, then, you know, that's that's the outcome. It's not about that. I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to just dive into some of the questions. Um, Like, if you had to put your finger on five things that a business, let's say you've got a business who are kind of, they're not quite at that 1.5, 1.6, and they want to get there. What would be three to five things that you'd say, focus on this? Obviously, it's going to be business specific, but as a general, what are the things that you think businesses need to focus on to make that leap from five, six, 700,000 to 1.5, 1.6? Okay. So firstly, that your house is in order. And as much as you're on the right side of compliance, your people are in the right roles. You've got systems and processes, yep. that right? Because the only lever you've really got is growth. And at the moment, it's organic growth. Um, I'm, and organic growth is basically having one new clients as, as advocates in the community for you. And also that you're getting the right type of clients as yep. well. The second part is that we've just got a proliferation of media platforms that can be used as well to tell your story. That's Uh, true. And more than ever before, and it's low cost input um, and really good outcomes. Uh, And so it's creating that brand. So look to growth both organically uh, and also out and wider apart by brand promotion. Um, and that's again is really just telling people about what you do and, and giving information freely. Um, but many people just don't even say what they really do. Uh, it's a banner, you know. Um, but how? Why? What's your mission? What you know? So I would say focus on the organic systems, processes all the time. Uh, Love it. Yeah. It's um. As a guy, Alan Smith, who, who is an advisor in the UK, I'm going to run a podcast with him in the next few weeks. He run, he's actually got a podcast called The Trap Podcast. Uh, he has built up, it's interesting to say about the media platform because he, over COVID, he decided he was going to sort of take Twitter a little bit more seriously. And he's now over a short period of time, he's built up, a twenty, I think, 25,000 following and he generates a lead a week and he doesn't even advise anymore from 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 that. So yeah, I, I'm 100% agree. But that we're at the, honestly, the, the tipping point. Of, of what advisors can do on social media? Yeah, I've just been a judge on uh, Accountant Daily and their, um, their annual awards. And I came across a bookkeeping business. That was a category I was doing. I was going, oh, geez, I really don't want to do this. Yeah. Um, within that, um, one business had was experiencing growth of over 800%. Now, they have had growth, and this is a mature business, but they yeah. were using multi-channels. The other part of what they were doing is they were using AI to get uh, to get content that could put them out there so there yep. wasn't an investment of time. They were also building an AI bot that was doing a lot of the manual work. And they were a regional practice in booking. So, and yet one of the most entrepreneurial businesses I've seen for a very, very long time. Wow. Uh, and again, this is part of the, my confidence of the future is, you know, I, I do the accounting and then I do IFA excellence and I also do woman in finance. We've got this new generation coming through. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, our quality people and businesses. Yeah, 100%. I agree. What's your big, big tip? For the next three to four years, as a business owner, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the the years ahead, that the thing that's going to be most important, or you think the thing that's going to be most certain is going to happen. Um, Just a tiny, tiny little question there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's a it's no great revelation, and it's it's still focus on the profit. You know, yeah. You know, if you liberate your PL, then you actually can liberate lifestyle, you can make informed decisions, you know, and you can, uh, you've got choice and options. 
And, and I think that one thing of the future is it, it is unpredictable. So always have a choice, you know, and always have options. Um, and in liberate your PL, it also starts shifting your balance sheet as well. Um, be investor ready, you know, uh, have built in buffers and protections. Right. Uh, when life doesn't go well or it does, you know, to be able to capture moments or protect their moments. If somebody wants to chat to you about the getting evaluation done, what's the best way of, of connecting? Yeah, look, just come through um, website, uh, ring our office, um, and yeah, happy to have that's, a chat. That's fortesolutions.com.au? Forte Asset. That's the one. Yeah, .com.au. .com.au, beautiful. Um, awesome. I, 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 this has been absolutely amazing. We could keep going and going because I, I feel like we there's so many different areas we haven't dived into, but I really appreciate you sort of taking the time to, to, to talk to me, to be honest. Um, Stuart, I don't think I've ever been as most personally exposed as uh, I have been with you, but I know I'm in safe hands. So, so thank you very much for the opportunity. No, I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you have a great weekend and thanks to everybody who's joined me. Uh, if you need to get the replay, just keep an eye out for the, the, the podcast, which is on uh, wherever you get good podcasts and probably bad ones as well. But uh, Stephen, have a great weekend, whatever you're up to. And uh, right. yeah, speak to you soon. And to you and all viewers, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Well, there we have it. I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. I hope you sort of uh, got a bit of insight, not just into what is going on in the industry in terms of business valuations and trends, but most importantly, you know, you, you, you enjoyed hearing uh, the story behind uh, someone who's very well known, very well respected, and, and I think one of the best in the industry at what they do, because uh, I know I did. Um, keep, keep your eyes out, by the way. We've got some more great guests coming up over the next uh, few episodes. But I want to just put something out there. Uh, late last year, I made a decision uh, that I wanted to launch a new coaching program. For those of you who have you know, checked out our, our, our offerings, we, we, we have two programs. We have the Practice Evolution Program and the Practice Foundations Program. But this new program is going to be something a little bit different. And I made a decision that I wanted to work with businesses that are, I guess, a little bit more progressed. They are in what I would call the more advanced stages of growth or they're, they're moving in that direction. And importantly, uh, I'm looking to work with industry BDMs, PDMs or other representatives for institutions in order to help make this a really effective model. Now, if you're interested in knowing more about this, in other words, you, you, are, you are that kind of business owner and you're looking for a program which is which gives you puts you in the right room with other people who are, you know, where you are, they're facing the same kind of issues, or you are a BDM, a PDM, or you represent an institution in working with uh, advisors and you, you like the sound of this at a high level, head over to our website, ourdairy.com.au, uh, look for the Practice Excellence Program. And jump in there. Uh, if you click on join the waitlist, uh, what it will then do is it'll send you a program brochure, just giving you an outline of what it's all about. And uh, at this point in time, we're just kind of putting it out there. But I'd love to know if this is something you might be interested uh, in, certainly learning more about, perhaps um, being part of when we launch in late 2023. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Finnovator and uh, stay tuned for the next that is coming up soon. See you.